Okay, so last week, um, kind of staying with you know my theme, I, I, and my theme that you guys know as far as my life is struggling with satisfaction um, and joy, I mean, to a certain extent. And so what we covered last week was uh, a verse out of Psalm 118 that says, this is the day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we talked about how Hey, that, that's a song, that's a verse that all of us know that have spent any time in the church at all, especially with that song that we sang as, you know, me as a little kid even. Um, and we talked about the context of that psalm, and the context of the psalm is, you remember what the context of the psalm was? It's real life, and it was real life back in Old Testament times, real life was real hard life, okay? It was war, it was conflict, it was battle, it was true life and day stuff. So the psalmist, he, he writes that verse towards the end of Psalm 118 after talking about basically asking God and, and praising God for the deliverance and the salvation that he had provided. And again, it's easy to think of those, especially when you read the Psalms, it's easy to put those into kind of the spiritual context, of, you know, especially the words salvation and deliverance. But he was talking about real salvation and deliverance as far as his life. That he was literally saved from his enemies, talking about the war context. And again, it, it, this is something that we, it's really hard for us to really grasp the magnitude of that because you and I have never gone to literal war with our neighbors or with, with an enemy to where we're scared uh, about what could happen to our family or friends or community tonight regarding life and death stuff. So Psalm 118 is this, again, it shows the reality of life in the Old Testament context, and you get this verse that says, um, this, is the door, this is the day that the Lord has made. And if you remember, we talked about, I, I think the, the, the in-depth look of that is, is, that's what's on this side right here, talking about God. We pulled all this stuff from Psalm 118, as far as, this isn't just this neat little song or verse that says, wow, this is the day the Lord has made, Let, let's be glad and rejoice in it, behind that is this concept. So behind that is life is hard, it's difficult, it's dangerous, it's full of sin, it's full of, you know, kind of all the bad stuff. And those of us who believe in God, we have this hope because of this, this is what's behind that, that first part of the verse that says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Now there's a lot of still, there's still a lot of hard stuff regarding that concept, if you're if you're actually thinking about it, okay? It doesn't explain away the hard stuff of life. Even as I go into Matthew here in just a minute, Matthew chapter 6, um, and I was debating whether or not to even go there, but it, it doesn't explain away, or, or it, it helps, it gives hope, but yet beside it is still the reality that, hey, th this life that we live in, these bodies that we live in, it's still hard, okay? But it accentuates even more this idea of where do we really get hope then? Because if God isn't real, and if this isn't real, and, and especially you know thinking about that verse, so let me go through this, that God is sovereign. We talked about the, the, this idea that God, God is the author of today. So he created today, he knows, and in that, he knows what today, he knows what today is going to bring, he knows what it's going to entail, the good, the bad, and the ugly. God knows all of it. And he's the author of it. He's the creator of it. But it's not just left there. Because if, if left there, that could still be a negative. You could still believe that God is this big, bad, negative, dictator, sovereign authority guy out there. But scripture shows us that not only is he just is he sovereign and creator of today, what what he allowed, and this is where it gets hard, and, and I, you know, you guys can ask questions or make comments if you want, but he is creating today because he's a good God. So what he's allowing you to experience in your life, whether it's physically, emotionally, relationally, it's meant for your good. And that can be real hard. But that's what the Bible, that's what the Bible presents, that God is a good God. He, he is a sovereign God. He's author of today. He knows what today is going to bring, and that is meant to be good for you, us, as his creatures, okay? 
Um, and it's and not only is he good, but he's good because of his steadfast love. But scripture over and over again is 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 nailing that point. It'd be interesting to look at that Hebrew word or phrase and see how many times that that is said in the Old Testament. I bet it's, it's one of the most repeated words or phrases in the Old Testament because that's said over and over again. So from beginning to end, God is the author of today. He knows what today is going to bring because he's good, and he's good because of his steadfast love for us collectively, and I would say individually, okay? Um, and that steadfast love lasts forever. God is for me. God is my helper. God answers. God is my refuge. He's my strength. He's my salvation. So that, that was all packed into Psalm 118. It was all said really before you get to the end of the, the chapter there, at the end of the psalm, where he then says, hey, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and, and rejoice in it. And I kind of focus, I narrowed in on that, that scripture, because again, that idea of rejoicing and being glad. And, and I, 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 we can use me as the example um, in that. I, so I focused in on that because I struggle with, with rejoicing and being glad. And just even thinking about the context of Psalm 118, if you think about the psalmist, if this was David, and so the point in time in which, he, which I believe that the context shows us is that he wrote this in those times to where it is easy for humans to rejoice. I should say this. When is it easy for humans to rejoice? Like, things are going well. When things are going well, and specifically when, when, when what specifically happens or goes well. If you think about it in terms of Psalm 118. So we're on the back end of, he just got delivered. He just got saved. And that salvation involved victory. So he was victorious. God provided victory over the enemies, over the bad guys. Okay? So at that point in time, if you think about it, when, whenever, especially when you come from, holy cow, I need help, I can't save myself, and, and you're in fear, doubt, uncertainty, anxiety, and God provides deliverance, God provides salvation, not just like emotionally or spiritually, but in, in the psalmist's case, physically, that's when it's really easy, and it's natural, it's interesting, it's natural for humans to rejoice. Again, I'm, an Af I'm a fan of sports, and, and I don't like the NBA, but I love basketball. Um, was was a game five last night. Um, the Milwaukee Bucks end up winning, winning a, a, a close game, back and forth game. So the fans of Milwaukee, it is if you see them, what they showed on the on the screen, they're rejoicing in the streets. Really easy to rejoice. That's kind of a dumb example, but that, that's easy. Okay, humans naturally, they don't have to contrive it. They don't have to create it. They don't have to sit here. You know, do whatever to create this feeling of gladness or joy. There are certain things about the human life that when, we, when we're brought to those points of times to where we experience victory, we experience success, we experience help, salvation, deliverance, it just automatically happens. Well, my issue is, what about all the other times? Like that verse says, this is the day the Lord has made. That's why I even covered it, because... It's not just the day of victory. Well, you know, we could present the argument that every day is a day of victory for God. That's, that's kind of easy to say as a religious person, philosophical, theological person. We all believe that, right? I mean, if you believe in God, you believe in Scripture, we believe that every day is victorious for God, right? Every day should be, I'm shooting on you now, okay? I said should, for those of you who have been here, right? So that's a saying of mine that, that we, we impose shoulds on us, especially in church land, all right? We, we live with this burden of a big burden sack that says shoulds. And my argument, what Jeff and I are trying to emphasize here at this church, is that Scripture is full of not shoulds necessarily, but is, 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 is. God presents the way life is and the way he is, and then he says live in it. Okay, we're the ones that do the should thing. Okay, so oh, where was I going with that? You guys remember what I was saying? Um, 
totally forgot my train of thought. <laughs> it's easy to rejoice when things are going well. Okay, so easy to rejoice when things are going well. But, oh yeah, it's, it's, the, it's believing in the should thing. I should believe that I should live a life of, and I do, and, it, and I want to live a life of satisfaction and joy, believing that everything I'm experiencing today is a gift from God. So, but I don't do that, okay? I struggle with satisfaction. I struggle with joy. I mean, on a constant basis. It doesn't mean I'm depressed all the time, but that's why I'm angry most of the time. Sorry, Patrick, I just pointed you all. <laughs> I'm going to make you a t-shirt that says angry. I'll just use you as my, my uh, whatever, my um, picture of anger. <laughs> His t-shirt today says, I forget something new every day. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I struggle with that. So it's easy to understand rejoicing and joy and being glad when things are good, and, and especially when, you know, we can really look at God and go, wow, thank you, God, for whatever that it, it is that he's done. And those times are good, but, but how, do we, how do we experience that? How can we experience that in the other times? Okay, uh, I sent Jeff a quote that I saw on uh, Twitter this week, and it says this, a sick man only wants one thing, but a healthy man wants 10,000 things. So it's interesting when you talk about success and when things are going okay, there, there's this difference between experience the immediate, experiencing the immediate victory like the psalmist was describing. He's on the back end of an immediate victory like the ball game last night. And he's, it's just automatic. I'm rejoicing. I'm being glad. This is the day I'm relishing in the fact that God made this day because he's provided the victory. But then when, when, when he continues to experience that success, and again, for me, when life is good, hey, it gets complacent. In, in, in a very real sense, it gets apathetic. When I talked last week about wanting to move to Montana and being tired of the politics here, being scared about and mad about, I'm already preemptively mad, Patrick, <laughs> about what could happen. So think about that. I'm preemptively mad about what could happen. That's the human existence. You hear how stupid that is? I'm preemptively mad about what hypothetically could happen. That's crazy. That's insane. <laughs> what, Ronnie? Am I insane? Am I the only one? That, that, that's, why I'm not, that's why I'm not saying we. I'm just saying this is about me, okay? When I come and talk about, when I come talk or teach Sunday school, this is about me and my experience. And I really hope that, that you can see how it's tied to you. I really, I, I hope, even if anger isn't your issue, whatever your issue is, you have issues. So don't fake like you don't. She's over here, right? <laughs> Everybody has a happy face. Everybody looks like that they are experiencing joy all the time when they come to church on Sunday morning. And like probably 80% of you aren't even hearing what Jeff and I are saying because you're struggling with anger or whatever inside right here. So anyway, that's why we have that's why we have church. And get a break. This is an opportunity to be an interrupted from our normal way of thinking. So now I, I wanted to bring up the normal way of thinking. And we we've talked about this, I mean, for years and hours here at this church. And again, now because we have really, you know, the church is almost new now as far as the the uh, the people that are here. I, I'm just going to bring this up just in kind of just to, to show you that this is this is a foundationally what we believe. So I, I'm bringing back, I, I'm talking about normal human thinking. Why do I and possibly you struggle with satisfaction and joy? Okay? <laughs> it is because of the normal human heart. That every creature suffers with. It's it is the curse, and it, it ultimately it shows us why we need God. To me, it, it proves that there is a God. That this normal human thinking, this this state of being in which I am, in a sense, almost constantly not fulfilled. And and let me clarify that a little bit more. So for me, so when I say that I'm I'm in a sense almost constantly not fulfilled. That doesn't mean I'm sitting here saying, 
I'm not just mad all the time because I'm mad that I'm not fulfilled. That, that reveals itself in this sense too. That when I'm experiencing something that's really good, and, and in a sense I'm taking joy in it, and I'm liking it, and I'm satisfied in it, I want, I want that even more. Okay, so in a sense, I can't just even relax and relish in the satisfaction that I'm enjoying it. I'm thinking this could or should be even better. And so then now, instead of resting in the, that, that, that I mean, just take food, for instance. If, if a little bit of this steak is good, then, then more of it should be better. <laughs> See, so in a sense, so I'm not mad because the steak isn't bad. No, I'm already dissatisfied in a sense that I'm not, I can't just go, hey, thank you, God, this, this tastes really good, and I'm resting and relaxing in the fact that right now, I'm just fine. No, see, my human heart goes, no, I'm not fine. This should be better. If this shows me this can be this good, it can be even better. So now let's start working towards that. See, so it, I hope that makes sense. So the normal human heart, why is it that we experience we can experience joy and satisfaction in God in those moments like the psalmist. But why is it so hard kind of the rest of our lives? Or why do we have to be reminded of it? Or why do we have to kind of work on it? Which sounds weird. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that. Because I think we can work on it to a certain extent. Work on it in the sense of even what we're doing right now. We're being interrupted and reminded of how good God is. And we can actually be glad and take joy in that. And be interrupted from normal human thinking. So normal human thinking, we, we keep on pointing to Romans 1. And I, and I wanted to lay this basis just again because so many people are new now. That just to highlight from a, a summary point of view what Romans 1 tells us. And Romans 1, we use Romans 1 now as kind of the foundational basis for our church. As far as how Romans 1 explains the human creature. Like what our problem is. And it's, it's really easy to understand this now, especially, at, at least for me, when I'm talking about my struggle with joy and satisfaction. Why do I struggle with joy and satisfaction? Well, listen to what Romans 1 says. And I'm going to jump right to um, verse, uh, I'll start with 18. All right, so Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known for, for what can be known about God is plain to them. Now, listen, don't... He's talking about everybody here, okay, guys? He's not just talking about the bad people or the sinners out there. It's really easy when you start seeing the words righteous and unrighteous. It's really easy to go, oh, that's not me. That's them, all right? No, this is everybody, okay? So he is describing... The plight of all people, no matter how old you are. And, you know, I've used the toddler example for a long time as far as it's really easy to see this in a toddler. But it, So listen to this. This is talking about you and me. For what can be known about God to everybody is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Now what's behind that is this stuff right here. He doesn't explain that in detail here, but basically he's saying that there is a God... So, so everybody that's ever been created, by looking at creation, by observing life, by experiencing life, knows that there is a creator, okay? That there is an almighty, sovereign creator behind all of it. And I, I would argue that behind Paul's thinking is obviously all of this stuff, too, okay? But he's just, he's just concentrating on the fact that, hey, that there is a God. He says, um, because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, and he talks about these, his, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So he's talking about this, this idea that there, everybody, all creation knows that there is a God. All right, That's evident by just observing life and creation itself. But then it says, for although they knew God, and again, the, the, top, the idea there is, although they knew that God is, is, is true, and that he's real, and that he's there, and that he's, he's, he's God overall. It says, they did not honor him as God. And I love what he says here next. He says, or give thanks. Because what's boiled, in that, and where that helps me, is, is that behind what Paul's saying here is this stuff. This idea that giving thanks, I mean, why would you give thanks to, to a God like, 
I mean, to the sovereign God. But what's going on? If I was really giving thanks and really had a heart of, of, of gratitude and thankfulness, what is behind? Why would I do that? Okay, there's number one. I have life. I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the God who gave me life. So number one, I'm thankful for my life. Now, even being thankful for my life is a recognition that this is good. I like my life, at least parts of it. <laughs> you guys get that? You know what I'm saying? That's all right. It's better to exist than not. Yeah, okay, it's good. Well, listen, and at its core, you guys are going to, you guys, until death's bed, will struggle to hang on to life with everything that you've got. I mean, that, that's part of the human existence, too. You and I will struggle with extreme fear when we're faced with death. We will. I'm not saying that that's not, that won't be tempered by, or God won't help us, God won't come alongside of us to help us with that. I'm just, I mean, come on, you guys. Have anybody, have any of you faced death before? I have, and it and it accompanied. It was accompanied by an extreme fear. Now that was followed by me begging God for help. Okay, so I, I'm not I'm not saying something that is heretical or anything. Okay, you guys are you guys have experienced that, and you will. So the bottom line is, this isn't just a, like a, a neat little thank you, God, for giving my life. No, it, it's behind it is life is good. I want it. I want to keep it. Thank you, God, for giving me it. Okay, so so there's one. Jack, what were you going to say? I just want to know if there's not going to be a story. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was in Guatemala. I almost, I almost drowned twice in about five minutes. I'd given up already. I mean, I didn't have any air left. And it was an extreme experience. So, um, yeah, that happened there. And I've been on a plane a couple of times that I thought was going down, and that was not fun. Um, so again, the, the idea behind gratitude and thankfulness. So if um, he says you didn't, they did not. So even though they know God is real, they didn't honor God as God, nor did they give thanks. So there's one. I'm thankful that I have life itself. It's better to live than not live. Okay. What else is behind thankfulness? Well, actually, the world we live in. That's my. When people say there's not a God, I say we just look at creation itself. The trees, the flowers, the birds, I mean, everything we have is something to be thankful for. The, not the, what we create, but what God created for us. Yeah, those, those flashes of life to where you're just amazed at, at creation, amazed at life. Just studying a little bit about um, evolution. You know, if you, if you go back to, to how evolution began and the, and the foundation of, of evolution, you know, they... They believe that this that evolution moves from simple to complex. Okay, that's kind of the big, one of the basics of, of evolution. And, and they pointed to the cell as being simple and, and how it moved to complex. But yet the more that we continue to, to, to be, the more that has continued to be revealed through microbiology and everything else and technology, the cell is like, the most complex thing. I mean, there, there's nothing more complex than the cell. And they just keep on, on, you know, peeling back the onion layer of the cell to see what else is in it and how it works and how it functions. Um, and so the more that, that, I mean, the more that I see glimpses of from the simple stuff, and you know, when I'm hunting in the woods and being amazed at what I'm seeing or what I'm experiencing, that, that throws me at this idea that this, this is amazing. And there's no way that this could have come about just by chance. There's no way. Uh, and, and the gratitude that comes from that. And the gratitude, I remember as a young, as a young guy, having some of the, this epiphany that I am, I am like, you know, like an ant is to me. I, I'm like that to God. As far as the size, my size on this globe is, I mean, it's smaller than a speck of dust. But yet, there's a God who cares for me. I mean, having that kind of a, an epiphany was just uh, mind blowing to me. So, so yeah, those kinds of things. So, but, so this 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 isn't just this like like this duty to give thanks. That's not what Paul's talking about. No, it's this really this belief, this understanding that if I believe that there's a, a God who who is for me, 
who, who has created me not only for my enjoyment, but for my good, for his glory, and, and all of these things that we do believe about God, hey, that when, when, we, when we really, those moments that we really believe that, it does really induce or the reaction can be a true spirit or attitude of, of thankfulness and gratitude. Well, he's saying, hey, they didn't give, they didn't honor God, nor did they give thanks. Yeah, Ronnie. Yeah, see. <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> Equals contentment. All right, so where I was getting to here, and I'll, I'll erase the final piece because that we started this with Father's Day. Um, the heart of humans, the, one of the main characteristics of the heart of a human is discontent. And again, we tie that, that was, that was Adam and Eve's problem, okay? At its core, Adam and Eve, they were not content with the fact that they wanted to be the one that chose what was good and bad for them. And they said, thanks God, no. We, we would like that option, all right? So discontentment. So he says, um, he says they didn't honor him as God, nor did they give thanks to him. And then, then it says, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And again, the way we get uh, distracted as Christian church people is we put that into religious terms. We think, oh, you know, the the immorality or idolatry of the Old Testament people, you know, they put up idols and they do. And so if I'm not doing that, then I'm, I'm, I'm not an idolater. Right? No, if you, if you think about this in terms of contentment or discontentment, satisfaction or, or dissatisfaction, this idea of being thankful or content in, in not just God, but me being created in what God has for me in my life. What you see here, that then, you know, all the things that they talk about here, it says, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passive passions. Again, you know, they talk about sexual stuff, and they talk about, you know, immoral stuff, but the bottom line there is that they're seeking we, I say they, we, people, creatures, we seek contentment in something else. We're not content in God. We're not thankful in, in Him. We're not thankful for what the way He made us and what He's provided for us in that everyday life. And so therefore, I'm seeking contentment in something else. Remember how I told you about the steak example? I can't just be content with how it tastes right now. It's got to be better than this. That's the thing. So now I'm going to look for anything other than God to be content in. So kind of the blatant examples are kind of the sexual examples or the immoral examples. But again, you know, good church people kind of go, oh, that's not me. I've never done that before. So that must be talking about the bad guys. No, the point is he's talking about you. And what is going on in your heart and my heart is exactly the same thing that is going on in the heart of somebody that exchanges, you know, some of those immoral things. I'll just read it. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Total side note, and I probably shouldn't even bring it up, but the whole, the whole homosexual thing, okay? Again, for church and Christians, they see that as something that is, con that is contemptible, that is immoral, that is terrible. My point with that is, each of us have a different flavor in which we're pursuing contentment because we're not content with God, okay? Some of those things are acceptable to you and other people, but, but you determine what is, what is acceptable and not acceptable, okay? So for some people, a man says, I'm going to pursue satisfaction and contentment with a relationship with another man. And for most Christian people and moral people, that's, that's unacceptable and you, you can't, you can't understand it. 
My point is, your heart and their heart is the same thing. We just pursue it in a different way. Okay? I, I mean, I hope, I hope you guys, I hope you can at least hear that, all right? Um, especially the next time you decide you want to condemn, you know, people that have a certain blatant act of pursuing contentment. So, I, I, again, I probably should have never brought it up, but Paul brought it up. I didn't. Um, but I, really, the, what I wanted to, to, to talk about here, it says, I always lose it, Ronnie. It says, where is the verse that says they exchange the truth for a lie? There it is, 25. It says, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Again, the point is, we because we don't find contentment in God, we, we're not satisfied with God, we're going to do that in, in any and all kinds of other ways. And, and what God has done for people, sounds really weird, he has said, okay, go ahead. You, you, you pursue contentment. Adam and Eve, you're not finding content, contentment in me. You're not thankful for the life that I've given you. You, you, you can't rest in, or you're not going to rest in, in, in the protection and the satisfaction of the relationship that I've provided you. Then, okay, I'm, I'm going to let you pursue what you think you're going to find satisfaction in. That's the bottom line. So God said, when God says he gave them up, he has given up all of us creatures he is letting us pursue how we think we're going to satisfy ourselves. Okay? And what he says is, in that pursuit, we exchange the truth about God. And what does that tell you right away? What's the truth about God? He's good. He's good. He's given me life. He's given me this life. He's given me this day. He's given me this body. And it's for my good. It's for his glory. It's because of his everlasting love. That's the truth about God. We've, we've exchanged, exchanged that truth about God for a lie. And now what's the lie we all believe or that we still struggle with in this existence? What's the lie? Not good, not gracious. Not good. It's not fair. I haven't heard that from my kids in a long time. That, that's the blank, blank things, little kids. Not fair. Um, yeah, what else? It's not fair. It's not good. For some people, it doesn't even exist. There's all these gifts here, they just came from nowhere. Yeah, so it's kind of insignificant. I mean, it's like, what's the purpose? I mean, if I didn't, guys, if I didn't believe in God, I know, I know how I'd be living. I mean, I know what I'd be pursuing. I'd pers be pursuing the satisfaction of, of me. I mean, in all kinds of different ways. I know that for a fact. If I didn't believe that there was a, a real God and there was a real purpose to this life, I know how I'd be living. So not fair, not good. God isn't for me. Even believe, if I believe in God, you know, the lie that I believe is, this is, this is, especially with this, not good, not fair, but he's not for me. He's just a big mean God up there, a big meanie head. Yeah. So, that verse where he gave them over to their own desires or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I just, I am just trying to correlate that to is that independence or is that sin? Like, is that directly related? If we're not pursuing him, is it sin, or is there this? Just trying to. Well, I believe it's both. What? What do you say about independence? Well, if if we know. Like we're we're rejecting God by not seeking Him, right? Because the, the, He's the center, He's the center. Of it. He's now said, "Hey, you want to look at whatever? You know, you, you want to do whatever? I'm gonna let you go do that." Uh huh. So I'm gonna let you go sin, or I'm gonna let you have more independence. Like they wanted a king, was that like was that sin that they wanted a king? Is like, or was it a different desire than what he had? Um, yes. <laughs> so, so if you if you use just use Adam and Eve as, as the example, okay. Now, now again, we're not truly independent, so he's not giving us independence. He, it's this weird thing to where. So yes, it is sin. So and, and just. 
I, I don't know where this where you were relating this to, <coughs> to chapter one. Well, I always have taken he needed them over to their own desires. That that sin, that's everybody that's pursuing homosexuality and all that other stuff. And I never necessarily put myself in that yeah, category. Right. But that again, it's easy to point to the yeah. bad stuff out there and say And you're saying, oh. no, that's all of us. Yeah. Which which again, so to help in the context, you guys know what Romans 3 says, right? Paul's just continuing to explain the reality of people and creation. And that's where, you know, in Romans 3, he doesn't distinguish between these people in Romans 1 and the people of Romans 3. So in Romans 3 is what you guys all know this, you know, where he's talking about, again, righteousness and unrighteousness. And he says, hey, there's no one that's righteous. Again, behind that is there's only one that's righteous. That's God. There's only one that's right. There's only one that's good. And he says there's nobody righteous. Every No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. And again, for those of you that those are hard words, but the point is, God is, he, he you, you said, it's all sin in the sense that we've rejected God. We don't honor him or give thanks. And so God is, in essence, he's letting us live the way we want to live. He let Adam and Eve live the way that they wanted to live. In that, they, they weren't thankful for God. So to me, it's, it's in a sense, it's a constant state of sin. See, again, the problem with church land is you're looking at, at the specific acts or actions of people as sin. And the idea there is, hey, you don't, you're not, you, you don't sin until you do X. What we've tried to present here is this, I, what Paul is presenting is, no, I'm born a sinner. I'm born into a state of sin, okay? And, and like this right here, he says, hey, there's nobody that seeks God. They've all turned aside. They've all, they've all gone their own way. Their throat is an open grave, you know, on and on. That's describing every creature from the moment I'm born, okay? And, and again, what's the good news? At least what we believe here at this church. The good news is this good God, even though he has allowed me to be born in the state of sin, and he's let me go my own way where I'm not content, I don't honor God for who he is, and I pursue my own way, and I, and I live in this believing lies state, he pursues me, and he decides to save me. And he shows me that there is a totally different, that, that, that what I'm believing is full of lies. Okay, I don't know if that answered me. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, Ron. You guys hear that? Again, some of you haven't been here for a while. By the way, Ronnie, Ronnie in the women's Bible study has been studying Romans chapter 1 for eight years now, I think. So, so they have dissected every one of these words. And what she just said, again, for those of you that have been in the church any lengthy period of time, wh whether you've consciously like understood this or not or thought about this, what we who have grown up as Christians or been Christians for any period of time, what we automatically believe is that, is that sin is an action. That's what we believe. So I do, I lie. That lie is a sin, and now I've sinned, and now I'm a sinner. Okay, so basically what we humans have done, it's just normal human thinking, is I, we've associated sin with an act. And what Paul is laying out here in Romans 1 and what Ronnie just said is, and what the Bible is perfectly clear about, we just miss it, is that sin is a state of the heart, okay? 
those actions are just fruits of that state. Or you guys get you guys get that? So the, the idea of being discontent, being not grateful, me declaring myself as wise, and that's over and above God. You know, all these things that Paul says in Romans 1, we church land typically hasn't described as sin before. Because they're so focused on the morality piece. Okay? This isn't about morality. You guys are way worse than you think. <laughs> Hold on, Cindy. Yes, Isn't everything outside the will of God? Oh, man. Why do you ask hard questions like that, Cindy? Yeah, yeah the, my first response is, is there anything that's outside the will of God? No, that's really, okay, don't answer that. I mean, again, there's going to be people who think I'm a heretic. But in one sense, there is no outside the will of God. But I, I understand what you're saying. So, well, the kings went to war, and they didn't have to kill them. And they didn't win wars. And they were chastised for not asking the Lord. They were not even killed. That was outside the will of God because they didn't have to kill them. It seems to me. Yeah, we're born into it. I mean, we're, so I mean, we're not. Is, do we ever leave it? And we really don't. Ever leave what? That born in sin, what we do is get a parachute that Jesus puts on us and plucks us out. Oh, but that, that's what I was trying to understand. Like, we have never moved from that position. Because we still sin. We still have our discontent. All those things you described, that's still describing me. Now, not pre-salvation. Like I'm here. We're 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 searching for God here. Or we're we're worshiping God. We're studying. Like you keep saying, we don't seek God. But we are seeking God. We just don't do the hard. No, 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 no. Hold on. I, I said what Paul is talking about in Romans three is the state of people before being saved. Okay, that's the state of every creature. So before, before any kind of deliverance, spiritual deliverance or salvation from God in this life, nobody seeks God. I mean, honestly, they're not seeking. Again, there's, there's a, we could define that. What, what does that seeking mean? Um, so, we just, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I might scroll if you want. All right, go ahead. <laughs> so it is interesting. I think the, the text does describe that Dallas been saying, so there's the, there's the condition of the fallen human heart, the different terms that we use, we call it sinful condition, Paul would explicitly call it that here, but he does call it unrighteousness, which is virtually synonymous. So he says, when it comes to the manifestations of law, he addresses that in 28 and following of chapter 1. He says, look, be filled with all unrighteousness, from this depraved mind, this is what happens. <coughs> Wickedness, raving, envy, murder, strife, deceit, gossip, and these are attitudes and their actions that are fruits of, as you said, fruits of that fallenness. And you see them here. And as far as the issue of, okay, so if we're talking about ourselves, we see the point Jack said, but we're, we wouldn't be here if we didn't care about God. So isn't there a sense in which this does not describe us? Well, if you look at where Paul goes, as he unpacks this truth regarding man's nature, he literally anticipates that his readers who were Christians in Rome, he anticipates that they would hear this and say, Yes, that is true of them. He's using third-person pronouns here. I mean, that's them, that's they, that's the pagans. He anticipates that, which is why in chapter 2, he says, he switches it from them to you. He says, therefore, you, church in Rome, you, church at Summit Lake, you think you have you have no excuse. You pass judgment. In other words, saying, well, it's them. Passing judgment, it's them. He says, in that which you judge and not you condemn yourself, for you judge... You judge practice the same things. He's saying, look, there is still this reality about you. And yes, the fact that you go to Jesus is fantastic. And that's the beginning of you seeing the goodness of God. But it doesn't end there. And now life is a growing awareness of what is true about our condition that will not change, that will not go away until we get on the other side. And now there's a, this growing awareness of our condition. And so Paul doesn't depart from that or leave that behind and say, we don't need to say any more about your condition. No, he wants you to understand in great detail your condition, because that's what's true of you. And 
then there's the reality of grace, which says we've gone to awake you through the righteousness of God. It's now it's this persuasive argument regarding God revealing himself as the righteous one of all the <laughs> So what the Spirit is doing in us, right? That is the job of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And okay. as we sit here and we all wrestle through all that limited and we kind of wrestle through this, but that's what is happening as we wrestle through this, is God is awakening us to the teaching us of his, his righteousness. Okay, look, we did this a long time ago. So, Paul presents the fact that we're dead. Everybody's dead. But now, and I'll bring up Ephesians, but you know, chapter 1 and chapter 3 in Romans, it's the same thing. He just describes it in different words. So um, Ephesians chapter 2, he says, you all are dead in your trespasses and sins, right? You, you, you are dead. That's what he says. But then he says, but then you've been made alive. Because of God's love, you have been made alive. So the, the state of the creature when we're born is we're dead, spiritually dead creatures. Okay? Because, it, because of everything we've described. God has given us over. He's letting us go our own way. You can say that's outside his will, but guess what? That, that's the way, that's the reality of the situation. So we're dead, and the characteristics that Paul says in, in 1 and 3 of Romans, that's the characteristics of being a dead, spiritually dead person. I'm pursuing contentment outside of God. <clears throat> and it only results in death. And it only results in destruction. If, if God allowed us the end state of who we are as dead creatures, we'd all just mangle and kill each other, okay? <clears throat> so we're fallen creatures, we're dead. But he describes the reality of God and what he's done through Jesus Christ. And what has he done? He's pursuing dead people and he's making them alive. So he's saving you and I from ourselves. That's the whole idea of salvation. It's not hell he's saving us from. I know that sounds heretical too, all right? But if we just believe that God is saving us from hell, that's just fire insurance. All right, the reality is I need to be saved from myself. So God has decided because of his steadfast love, because he's good, because he's for me, he's saying, okay, I'm going to let Don Brewer experience himself for a lifetime. And I'm going to insert myself as a good God, and I'm going to make him alive. And, and so we're, this is kind of, I'm showing this as, this is, this is kind of the eternal or afterlife. This is here and now. Here and now. And what, what we're experiencing right now, what Jeff just kind of explained is, hey, I'm, I'm now even, because of the fact that God has made me alive, I am now aware of the fact of what's going on in my heart. That's proof that God has saved me. If I, if I believe, I, I can look at Romans 1 and say, yeah, that's Don Brewer. That's, what's going, that's, what, that's how Don Brewer has experienced Don Brewer. My problem with satisfaction is I'm not content in God and what he's given me. And I can admit that and I can see it. And I can go, God, please help me, save me from that. Help me to understand you more. Help me to believe that you are good even more than I believe now. I recognize that my discontentment is a rejection of God. I wouldn't be able to believe that if I hadn't been made alive. I, I, that's what I believe. That's what I believe that Scripture has shown us, all right? And so now, for whatever reason, because of God's reason, He is allowing you and I, as Christians now, as His adopted sons and daughters, who, he's been made, who he has made alive, he's allowing us to, we're in this kind of blended world now. You guys see that? That's why we still experience some of this, the, the ugly parts of, of, of sin. Now what I liked is what Jeff said, is, and, and what Ronnie has said regarding what faith is, and what the whole purpose of really salvation, what God is doing, is in this life now, I am being persuaded of the goodness of God. That's what he's doing in my life. He's primarily doing that as he's revealing to me where I'm discontent. And it's thrusting me at him. Because I'm realizing that the older I get, there's no other contentment outside of this miraculous contentment that really is God. Okay, So this is, this is reflective of, of like life now. 
Eventually, you know, when we get to heaven, we're, we're taken out of these bodies. We're going to be able to see and believe in God perfectly. Here, he is persuading us of how good he is. He is awakening us. Listen, he's decided that, that it is better for you and I, he, that he, when he saves us, because there's that question, philosophically speaking, or theologically speaking, throughout the ages of, hey, if God saves you and I, why doesn't he just miracle us to heaven like then? I'm convinced that it's because he is continuing to persuade me of how good he is. He's continuing to awaken me of, to my condition, which then thrusts me at needing God more. And the older I get, the more that my heart is revealed, the more I'm, I'm seeing that the grace of God is way bigger than I ever thought he was, it was last week. And I believe that in heaven... Because he's showing us who we are, especially as saved people now, I'm con what, what, what scripture is showing me more and more is, what, wow, this is who I am, and this is what I believe about God. And God, God this is going to be the, remember I, I talk about like the, the backdrop of a painting, or the, my life, in, 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 so in eternity going forward, when I'm finally out of this life and this body, I believe that I will be able, God is going to let me look back on my life, not in like, like, a, an ex, like in a negative sense, but in this extremely positive sense that says, I, I, I am amazed every second I'm in heaven that God saved me at all. And, and that my view of God is this great, big, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, grace-filled, love, loving God. I'm going to be able to understand that perfectly in, in heaven. And not just because I can understand things perfectly now, but because I'm going to be able to see my life perfectly in the sense of look what God did to me and for me. He gave me my life, not just physically, but he gave it to me spiritually. And in heaven, I'm going to be, I'm going to, I think I'm going to be blown away by that every second of, of my life in heaven. And I'm going to be perfectly content. I'm no longer going to second guess God and question God and, and think I'm the one, and I'm, I'm our, guys, we all armchair quarterback God. Anybody that's been married for a few days has, has armchair quarterback God. Or been a parent. We think we're doing things right, doesn't turn out the way we think it should, and who's the first person we blame? It's not fair. I did everything right. So again, guys, I hope this picture explains that a little bit. Because again, there, there's this kind of weird assumption that says, uh, okay, I've been saved, so, and Scripture says I'm no longer a sinner, in, in a very real sense. God sees Christ when he looks at me. He sees me as perfect and, and clean, but yet I'm not experiencing myself that way. Hey, the beauty of that is, again, this big picture of God, when he looks at me, he does see me as clean. He sees me, he sees Christ, he sees me as his adopted son. I am, I am delivered and freed, and, and in a sense, perfect in God's eyes. But that's because he knows what he's doing with me. He knows the end state. But yet right here in this world, he's allowing me to experience myself and see it through a truth lens now. I hope you guys can see that. I can experience this now. I can, I can go, wow, I'm, I'm discontent right now. And, and, and look, I, I mean, I have these conversations in my head. I, re, I know, I understand, I understand what that means as far as me rejecting God. But what that, what that spurs now is... A conversation with God in my head. Hey, so saying, God, you know what? I'm a, I'm a creature in need of help. Help me with this. We got to stop. You guys have any questions? Or Jeff left. He couldn't handle it anymore. He wants to get more steak to help me with. <laughs> yeah, I, you know that we kind of went way more in depth than I was planning on with some of the Roman stuff, but that kind of happens every time we talk about. So I hope you guys can see that. I hope, I hope we can even flesh that out a little bit more. I hope this makes sense, too, um, even with what you were asking, uh, Jack, or what you were saying. Uh, that It kind of explains this. We're kind of in two worlds right now, in a very real sense. We're, we have our, our foot in that I still see myself as this dead creature, and I see the characteristics of that, and I see what it's like to be made alive. 
and, and the blessing of God's grace as a result of that. And, and, and there's, for us, it's a, it's a struggle. It can be a struggle. But for God, he's doing it to show us how good he is and how big he is and how amazing he is. All right, let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for, I thank you for being real. I thank you for uh, awakening us. And I pray that you just continue to do that this morning and today. And that that awakening as to the reality of who you are and how good you are. The, the awakening of how you have made us alive and that even as you reveal to us our continued um, creatureness, that, um, that, that that awakening would, would help us to, to come to you as, as your children, asking for your help, being able to rest in your grace and your love. I thank you that that's the kind of God that you are and that's, that's how you have decided to, to make yourself known to us as a God who, because of your everlasting loving kindness toward us, that you are good and that what you are allowing in our lives on a daily basis is, is for our good and your glory. And help us to believe in that. Help us to rest in it and help us to take joy in it. Even as we experience discontentment, help that thrust us towards you so that we can see the reality of who you are. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.